Okay, so good afternoon. And uh, maybe good morning or good, good evening to online participants. So welcome to our open forum session on internet, uh, internet shutdown and network restriction. Uh, my name is Yoichi Ida, the Deputy Director General for G7 G20 Affairs uh, in the Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. And uh, uh, we uh, warmly welcome all the uh, participants, and in particular the uh, uh, panelists uh, on site and online. Today, uh, we have five uh, panelists and two panelists on site and uh, uh, three panelists uh, online. So, uh, first, let me introduce uh, two panelists uh, on site. Uh, on my left hand side, uh, Ms. Marit. Paravuta, I'm sorry, my pronunciation maybe. <laughs> Thank you. And she's a senior director from European Telecommunications Network Operators Association. And on my right hand side, Mr. Edmond Chung, uh, COE from Dot Asia. I hope uh, three other panelists are already online. The first uh, online panelist is Professor Azedel Akbari, uh, Assistant Professor in Public Administration and the Digital Transformation uh, at University of Twente. And second online panelist is Mr. Charles Mock, a visiting scholar at Cyber Security Center at US uh, Stanford University. And I hope uh, the final online panelist, uh, Ms. Nikki Masgatai, a senior policy advisor from uh, US uh, uh, Department of State in Digital Freedom Team in Bureau of Cyberspace and the Digital Policy. So today, uh, our session uh, will discuss the current situation and the future uh, policy implement, uh, implications of internet shutdown and the network restrictions. In the past few years, we have seen the importance uh, of network connection, which in particular demonstrated by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic expansion. And also we witnessed some policy uh, implication of internet shutdown when government tried to control their network. In particular, from the cases and the discussions around Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Not limited to those uh, uh, examples or cases, we have been discussing the possibility of internet shutdown and the network restrictions and the issues and challenges related to those uh, policy implementations and also some possibilities of some potential benefit of those practices. Today, uh, I would like to listen to experts, panelists, on-site and online of their views, opinions, and suggestions on those policy topics. In particular, 
the government of Japan is hosting uh, internet governance next year, and also we are taking the presidency of G7 next year. So our intention is to pick up this important uh, topic uh, as a part of our agenda, both in G7 and uh, IGF. Of course, G7 is governmental policy fora, and IGF is multi-stakeholder fora. But uh, we want to synergize those different discussions, and we want to promote the values of open, free, and unfragmented interoperable internet. So I would like to invite uh, five panelists to share the views and opinions and also some suggestions, proposals on internet shutdown and the network restrictions. And uh, probably, if possible, some proposal to our government when the government wants to discuss uh, these issues from governmental perspective, what would be the roles of government and what would be the roles of uh, government discussions in multi-stakeholder policy making. So uh, first, uh, let me invite uh, my, uh, Ms. Uh, Marit. Thank you very much. It's working. Um, so thank you uh, very much uh, for the Japanese government for organizing this interesting session and for having invited us as well uh, from ETNO. So just to brief background, um, I represent ETNO. So we are a trade association whose members are the European telecommunication operators. So 33 of the largest leading European telecommunication operators. And if you think about the role of operators, of course, when we talk about internet shutdowns or any kind of, well, meddling with networks, uh, operators are, for better or worse, the kind of the executional arm who will be, uh, let's say, operationalizing any of these things because the networks are run and operated and managed by operators. So, of course, this is an issue that is, uh, well, of critical importance to us and also um, an issue that we want to be very, very uh, well vocal about and want to be part of the discussion. So we are at the same time, so we represent the European operators and um, we are of course fortunate, we consider ourselves fortunate in Europe in that our legal and political situation does not really permit internet shutdowns as, as such, as we see you know, perhaps happening in some other jurisdictions more frequently. Um, we have some even European level regulation, um, open internet rules um, that, that lay out a kind of an environment whereby um, throttling or blocking of websites or network access is, is forbidden uh, by operators. So we are kind of living, trying to live up to the open internet, um, open internet uh, vision. Um, and by that also we then kind of mean that all end users should have access to all legal content, of course, uh, in, in good quality. And um, I think that, you know, that as a starting point is, of course, as I said, a fortunate one. Um, however, of course, when we look at the global internet, I mean, internet is an interconnected network of networks, so decisions in one part of the world might then impact, you know, other regions as well. And, and for example, I mean, if, if there is a part of the world or region who is, you know, has a shutdown or is blocking some parts of the network, you then might have unintended consequences, technically speaking, to the neighboring regions, etc. So, of course, um, we are not totally, let's say, um, uh, out, of the, out of the scope here. Also, some of our members do have their international operators, so they have presence in Africa, uh, you may know Orange, 
uh, in Latin America, Telefonica, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so we also have some uh, direct exposure there. One interesting um, point on Europe is that okay, we are saying that we don't really experience shutdowns um, as such, but. In the very recent past, in the context of the European um, energy crisis that we're currently um, uh, facing because of this uh, Russian war on, on Ukraine, um, there is more and more talk about power outages and the potential of power outages. And of course, the consequence of such outage would be that you know you may have an internet shutdown if you don't have the, 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 the kind of... Um, well, infra infrastructure protection and generators and, and a whole ecosystem to kind of ensure that you have internet connectivity that will continue. But we have revisited this issue a little bit in this context in, in the past months. But um, going into the impact, so from operators' point of view, um, of course, if there's a shutdown and if there is no legal framework, um, and I'm thinking here more the authoritarian context, this is a very, very difficult situation for an operator because you are asked by your government to, to shut down or part of the whole network and failure to comply may immediately put you know, your, your company but also perhaps the employed staff in some kind of a danger. So there is of course then uh, tendency to, to, to go and comply um, with any government ruling that is based on, based on local law. Um, and in a way it is not the private sector's position to go and question laws if they are written black on white. Of course we do advocacy and we are advocating open internet as we said, but, but you know, this is not then possible always in all circumstances. And of course then when you disconnect uh, the network, this has all kinds of consequences to the operator. So it may uh, end up in loss of revenue uh, to the operator in the very immediate term because you're cutting off all your customers. And also then this is very important for the customer base and the end users because it's not only end users, so it's not only a matter of fundamental rights, but it's also small and medium businesses, industries, etc. So you have whole sectors of the economy that are being shut off and are then losing revenue and are not able to um, continue their business. So this is having a lot of immediate and, and longer term um, consequences. And if we think it Think about it from the operator's point of view and investment point of view. So when operators want to upgrade networks, build new networks in whatever country, what they are looking at is legal certainty and also then, you know, an investment environment where they think that they can do business uh, with, with some certainty for the longer term because, of course, the upfront investments to build networks are very high, so you want to make sure that you will be able to run your business as well for the years to come. So if you see shutdowns and network shutdowns happening in an environment, it is a bit of a t deterrent then to invest in, in such an environment because it represents an uncertainty factor in a way. So it's, it's a bit of a vicious circle from, from the operator's point of view, but I do think that this is of course a thing that will apply for many, many other um, private sector players. And maybe just um, before I finish the impacts, um, there are also technical consequences. So as I already was saying, that if part of the network is shut down somewhere, then the traffic will be rerouted through the internet, through another alternative route. And this then may cause unexpected traffic flows and even congestion on, on networks. And uh, this, of course, is not something that operators like either because it may then have uh, additional costs, consequences, etc. You might have to manage the traffic, etc. So there are also technical consequences. But I won't, don't want to um, um, monopolize, so I will leave it there and maybe we can discuss the, the role of governments and the inter internet governance role uh, on the second round of comments so that everybody gets a word in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marit. Uh, uh, on the uh, perspective of the telecommunications operators and the business, uh, in, uh, 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 business players, uh, Actually, the the point of investment is very much interesting and has a lot of implication to the government too. 
So uh, next, uh, uh, let me invite uh, uh, online second online uh, uh, on-site speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Edmond Chung uh, from uh, Dot Asia. So please, uh, I I think uh, your experience in Asia uh, can be a, a, a little bit different, or maybe um, some different uh, uh, implications. So please. Thank you, Yudesan, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, this is uh, certainly a, a topic, the, the topic of internet shutdown is uh, quite dear to my heart. Um, uh, a si being based in Hong Kong um, just a few years ago, we would never have thought that um, this would be something relevant uh, locally, uh, but we watch uh, you know, uh, 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 these type of issues uh, come up uh, in other places. Um, now is uh, probably a very different uh, situation, and we are facing uh, some of these uh, the challenges, uh, potential challenges as well, and perhaps Charles can add to that. Uh, I know uh, uh, um, he can probably add to that in, 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 in his discussion. But um, Ia sans mentioned one part that I want to start with is that, you know, when uh, when when COVID came along, uh, a lot of the sh lockdowns, um, actually, w what we kind of witness is that when when the physical mobility of people is really curtailed because of lockdowns, the digital mobility becomes critical. And, you know, a lot of the work, a lot of things that, that continue to work is actually, you know, dependent on, on internet. And therefore, especially when you think about situations where physical mobility is curtailed, I think digital mobility must remain uh, open and, and you know, uh, uh, sustaining. The other thing about internet shutdowns often, um, you know, people uh, uh, forget about is that it's it's not just about content. I mean, and especially if you talk about um, uh, shutdown of the entire network, um, many different devices, even potentially life, uh, uh, you know, life sustaining devices could be connected and, and dependent on the internet connection. And by shutting down, that would, you know, could potentially uh, affect those devices and, you know, affect human life. So, in general, I guess um, from ICANN and, and, and the ICANN community, of course we stand for, for like a, an interoperable and global internet, you know, serving people around the world. Um, uh, one of the things that I, I think is, is important also is that, you know, it, in times of crisis, it is really through un, unimpeded access to internet and, and the flow of information. You talked about wars, you talked about sit crisis situations. Um, it's through unimpeded uh, access that uh, people can gain knowledge, they can, you know, they can be exposed to a diversity of different viewpoints and information. So, so that's actually especially critical when times of crisis uh, happens that access to information and communication be kept alive and could be life-saving. So the internet, however, is a decentralized system and um, as Marit uh, uh, mentioned, uh, operators play a role and no single actor actually uh, completely controls, uh, you know, the internet and, and you know, implements uh, shutdown, you know, so, so to speak. So different organizations play a role and on the reverse, different organizations play a role in, you know, kind of defending the, the, the internet as uh, um, open and, and free internet as well. Um, such as uh, myself, also another role that I have at Internet Society Hong Kong, um, platforms like IGF, uh, you know, in, in, in the Asia Pacific Regional IGF um, and RightsCon, many of these platforms are important to, to continue to uh, protect and promote freedom online. Um, and and, and I think it's not a, it's never a one and done thing. You can't write in a piece of paper and say, you know, we'll, we'll pr you know, uh, 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 maintain uh, internet uh, uh, up and running, but actually it's all about the, the implementation and the continual um, uh, uh, struggle and the, the continual dynamic that, that really uh, makes a difference. So I think, one of the questions, however, uh, is whether there are actually really legitimate reasons for complete shutdowns, right? I mean, this is one of the big questions. Uh, of, and of course, you know, we, we know that there are situations where uh, information is being weaponized, uh, uh, fake news, disinformation. 
you know, all, all these kind of things are important, uh, and maybe we have done too little too late, <laughs> and these echo chambers create uh, polarized societies, but are they enough? Uh, is th are they enough to really shut down uh, uh, the internet in all layers? Um, you know, shutting down on different layers may have different responses, and I think one of the things that I really want to point out is that, you know, shutting down particular layers is different, and especially in the technical layers, um, I think that is one important part to, to, to consider to actually keep up regardless of, of, of the situation. And this is an important discussion, um, I think, during peacetime, <laughs> uh, because when, when it's not, you know, when, when you're in a war, when you're in a crisis, it's probably too, too late to talk about upkeeping of, of the network. So is there legitimate reason? Maybe, for example, technical attacks, DDoS attacks uh, that are widespread, but even in those situations, the response probably should not be centralized, right? In response to, uh, in response to cyber attack, the response should be distributed and not centralized in terms of shutdowns. So, so I think you know, one of the important things is to really think through and develop policies and procedures to to keep the core infrastructure on, you know, online really and. This particular process, um, I think, is important to think through uh, using the multi-stakeholder model uh, and the multi-stakeholder uh, mechanisms. In terms of content layer, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to say an absolute no to, to things like, you know, if information is being weaponized, if disinformation is happening, whether certain levels of, of um, of, uh, of takedown is, is important. But there again, I think multi-stakeholder mechanism that can hold platforms to be accountable, not, not really governments, not, you know, governments should be part of the multi-stakeholder model, but not the decisive factor on, you know, these type of uh, shutdowns. So um, I think, you know, uh, and the last par part that I wanna add is uh, besides the, um, the, the content part, besides the advocacy part that, that different stakeholders uh, should really uh, do and also the policies to, to, to be set, I think um, another interesting thing is technically, uh, I think users think, um, think about community networks uh, to, to be built for the resilience of, of networks, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 and, and um, to, to make sure that on top of the telco networks, uh, community networks can actually uh, play a role in crisis situations as well. So I will kind of, you know, uh, leave it with, with four points that I would, you know, summarize uh, that, that I wanted to bring up. One is, you know, we need to distinguish between um, defensing against cyber attacks uh, or versus stifling speech in the sense, or uh, stifling speech, it's a bad word, but uh, attacking or defending against disinformation is really what we're talking about. We, we have to distinguish the two. Um, Second point is that um, when cyber when we develop responses to cyber attack, shutdown may not be completely, um, uh, I mean, may be useful in certain cases, but they have to be developed as a distributed, decentralized response. Um, and then thirdly, I think the multi-stakeholder mechanism is most important in terms of developing these, these processes. And the fourth point is really develop these policies uh, to keep the core internet infrastructure online uh, early <laughs> uh, before, before crisis happens. So that's uh, what I want to add. Thank you very much, Edmond. Uh, I, I think you uh, demonstrated the importance of multi-stakeholder uh, discussion uh, con being uh, continued from the peaceful and uh, very normal time and so that the everybody can be uh, prepared uh, when some legitimate necessity comes up. And so uh, now I would like to invite uh, on online uh, participants. And first, uh, I would like to invite uh, Assistant Professor uh, uh, Akbari from uh, University of Twente. Uh, I think uh, your experience and uh, your story uh, will also give us uh, uh, some uh, wider range of uh, perspective and understanding. So uh, please uh, take the floor.
Yeah, we can see. Interests are in in um, information and communication technologies for development and um, surveillance studies, especially in authoritarian contexts. So today I'm going to present the case of Iran as one of the examples that I think um, sort of is a is an interesting way of looking at internet shutdowns. So if you look at the structure of internet governance in Iran, you will see that um, you have this um, hardware infrastructure that is. Um, quite lately uh, was developed inside Iran. And very soon, um, there are layers of surveillance and um, integrated in the, in the infrastructure. So the ISPs, for example, were forced to um, filter some of the keyboards, there are URL blockings and so on. Um, you also have um, a lot of interception technologies used by the Iranian government. For example, blacklisting complete URLs, deep packet inspection, man-in-the-middle attacks, SSL blocking, and all sorts of technologies that are used to curb and limit and control Iranian users' access to, to the global internet. And <clears throat> on top of that, you have a lot of governmental organizations that are also actively um, engaging in content production and also content control and moderation on, on platforms. So you have uh, Iranian cyber army uh, uh, that is established in 2005 and a lot of committees that most of them are working under the direct supervision of the highest um, um, offices in, in the um, Iranian government. So apart from these um, infrastructural, interactive, interceptive kind of layers of control and institutional layers of control, you have the users that obviously they want to have access to the global internet. And using the internet in Iran is very much coupled with using VPN technologies. And there you can also see that there is a chaotic market of VPN technologies. For example, the Iran during this recent uprising, the Iranian regime has also tried to inject some of their own VPN technologies into the market. And by that, they are having direct access actually to the data of people who think they are using VPN technologies. Apart from this internet governance sphere, I also want to emphasize that this is a, this is a surveillance assemblage. It's, this is not only about internet governance, but there are also other ways that are um, other systems that are integrated in the internet system. So for example, um, you have the national digital identification and the Iranian regime has also tried to have biometric data banks to develop biometric data banks for the purposes of national digital identification. But we have seen during the current protests, for example, that they are matching faces using facial recognition technologies in, on the streets and so on. So you have the different layers of surveillance going on there. One of the most important things that I want to emphasize today is the national internet network. It is one of the most um, ambitious, one of the most expensive uh, projects of the Iranian government. Um, and what is, what is called national internet network is basically a national intranet. So it's a network inside the country, all the servers are inside. And Inside Iran, you have two separate cyber spaces. One of them is the global internet uh, that has a free flow of information. And the other one is a cyberspace that is localized. And what we are seeing at the moment is, is that the internet shutdowns are not only used to curb access to the internet. So we had this before in 2019. Uh, during the protests at the time, we saw, we have witnessed that the Iranian government used five days of internet shutdowns, complete shutdown of the internet. And during those five days, 1,500 people were killed. But this time, what we are seeing during the internet shutdowns is that the government is using, um, is obviously showing um, some different behavior. They are responding to user behavior. So we have patchy internet shutdowns. We have localized internet shutdowns. Um, we have sometimes internet shutdown just in one area, in one local area that a demonstration is happening. We have internet shutdowns just on the mobile phone um, uh, uh, connections and not on the cable. So the government is also playing with the kind of internet shutdowns. And you can imagine if you're 
shutting down the internet on mobile phones in a demonstration area, it's, it basically means people cannot connect to each other, cannot upload videos and so on. So you sort of very, in a very intelligent way, shut down the internet. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize today, that the internet shutdown is also becoming more and more intelligent. It's not only switching off one, uh, one connection to the global internet. What is the solution? How can we talk about that? I think if you're going to the theoretical level of what kind of discourses of internet governance we have at the moment, um, I've put it on a range to show that different countries are standing on different points on this range. And traditionally we had multi-stakeholderism, the, the, which was uh, very much supported by the United States of America. It's based its economy is based on free market and its values are about free and open internet. On the other hand, uh, we have the multilateralism um, with China really tried to advocate it for that. Obviously, China is um, doing that th through a controlled market. And the main discourse that China is using there is digital sovereignty. Um, we have obviously other models that are taking components from each of those. So we have the EU model. EU model also uses a lot of digital sovereignty discourse, and it happens in a regulated market closer to the free market. But EU model also takes um, a very uh, fundamental approach to the rights. And this rights-based approach is something that we see, for example, in GDPR, in data protection, in privacy rights, in Digital Services Act, in, in at the moment at the European Union, and so on. Whereas the EU model and the US model are trying their best to collaborate together. Um, at the beginning of this month, we had the Future of the Internet, for example, conference at the European Commission and different delegations from, from the United States and the European Union um, tried to collaborate to defend uh, the global and multi-stakeholder model of um, Internet. We would see we, we see more and more countries that are trying to um, use this kind of discourse of digital sovereignty for internet shutdowns, for controlling access to the internet, um, and especially intelligent kind of internet shutdowns. So what we can do, I think um, maybe things that I'm saying here is. Um, obviously within the framework of human rights, freedom of expression. But I think it is also important that, to notice that the United Nations is also now ad advocating for, for freedom of assembly in digitally mediated spaces. So it's more about, it, it's about more uh, human rights and more freedoms um, other than just freedom of expression. And finally, this might seem to be a visionary kind of idea, uh, but I think um, the private, uh, firms and big tech companies have already shown a lot of interest. There's a lot of innovation and technological progress. When it comes to free, basic internet access globally, we have seen Meta's free basics, we have seen Elon Musk's Starlink and so on. Obviously, these companies have their own profit-oriented uh, agenda. They have their own ways of dealing with um, issues of internet access. But I think as an, as, a, as an international community, we have shown that there are some um, areas that the international community can work together. We have seen, for example, uh, that more or less there is free basic vaccination available for all human beings on this planet. And I think if we are thinking about the digital future, then we should think about internet also as a global public good. And in that sense, international organizations can also really develop a kind of infrastructure that is free from governmental interference in a sense that every human being can have access to at least some sort of um, uh, connection to the global and free internet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Professor Akbari. Uh, it's a very different uh, world. Uh, uh, existing in Iran and uh, uh, we need need to think uh, what we can do so next uh, speaker will uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Charles Mock uh, the visiting scholar at uh, cyber security center at uh, Stanford University so uh, Charles uh, floor is yours Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can, you can hear, hear me, you right? And see you. Yep, I can good. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Aida. Uh, well, uh, it's great to follow uh, Professor uh, Akabari's presentation because uh, it's very important, I think, to realize that oftentimes when we think about internet shutdown, we think about the whole network being shut down, but oftentimes it is very related to uh, many different measures of censorship and selective network restrictions. So like you mentioned, uh, shutting down the mobile network only, uh, or maybe in only a certain part of the, the, the country or city, uh, because a protest is going on possibly, shutting down certain uh, uh, access to services, or technologies uh, or, or technical uh, infrastructure, for example, certain parts of the HTC, HTCB uh, traffic or encrypted DNS and so on, or blocking certain apps, or even in some cases, just uh, removing certain apps or, or functions from uh, the from the apps or the removing the apps from the app stores. So all these are actually very, very similar to many of the measures that we normally talk about as part of censorship. So to me, internet shutdown is actually the most extreme form of censorship. Uh, and 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 that is what we have to keep in mind. Now, Edmund brought up a very interesting question about whether there's any motivation or any possible uh, justification for having an internet shutdown. Now, I personally cannot think of many of any of these reasons because if you look at the reality of what has been happening recently or in the past many years, five, 10 years of governments uh, shutting down part of the internet in their countries or regions, uh, you, you, you never really see that they were doing it because they were under cyber attack or some sort of reasons that, uh, admin that you mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, we always see that it has to re be related to certain, uh, popular uprising, uh, people going on the street to protest or it has to do with elections. Uh, and that is how governments, uh, some governments seem to think that that is the easiest way to influence the result or the discourse or the, uh, or the sentiment or to suppress certain uprising or shut or, 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 or uh, popular expression of uh, people's uh, opinions. Now, I also want to point out a uh, 2022 report on internet shutdown that was published by the uh, Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights. And they concluded that internet shutdowns create significant obstacles that damage economies, democratic processes, and the flow of information, which may erode trust in electoral processes and increase the likelihood of hostilities and violence. So. To me, this is almost like uh, I cannot find any uh, justification for doing such a shutdown. But why are governments doing it? I think the biggest reason is that it is easy. They think that it is easy and it can be done uh, as a form of extreme digital repression uh, or censorship in their countries. Now, you do see that some countries do not, uh, even though they are very uh, repressive uh, in, in the sense of the internet uh, 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 environment, but they don't go with the tactic of internet shutdown. For example, China, because in China, I think it's a good example of having a very sophisticated system of censorship and surveillance that they do not need to go to the extreme. And in most cases, they feel that they are already able to control uh, to the uh, to the satisfaction of the uh, of the dictators. But uh, it, of course, uh, uh, there are also still some examples uh, in China where there were regional shutdown, for example, in Xinjiang in 2009 and so on. So they, they in an extreme situation, they may still resort to this form of uh, uh, tactic. So. 
for example, right now there's been significant COVID uh, protests going on in China. I think it remains to be seen whether or not uh, China will take uh, some measures of partial shutdown of the internet uh, in the coming weeks, for example. Uh, so that remains to be seen. Now, unfortunately, even as governments are doing it, I mean, what can we do? Um, I think we have to talk about uh, many of these impact of internet shutdowns uh, in a more quantifiable way that will make it easy for policymakers to understand the significance and to do something about it. For example, uh, what are the economic impacts? What are the social impact? Uh, what are, I, I think, uh, uh, it, I, I think it was uh, uh, a previous speaker uh, 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 that that talked about the uh, the uh, impact on investment. I think this is very interesting that we have to look further into. And I think also uh, uh, she talked about the uh, technical impact. Uh, for example, the rerouting of the uh, of the uh, traffic, making certain parts of the uh, internet becoming more congested and becoming an issue of uh, affecting the global internet security and resilience. I think these are very quantifiable uh, 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 studies and research that we have to get into and to expose the cost to the world and not just to these countries about uh, uh, internet shutdown. But I also want to talk a little bit about the economic impact. Uh, there, uh, the For example, the OECD uh, organization estimated that the 2011 uh, internet shutdown in Egypt actually cost them uh, 90 million US dollars. And that actually does not include the sex, what they call secondary uh, economic impact, uh, such as loss of revenues from e-commerce, tourism, and things like that. So the direct cost is already quite high. Uh, there are also uh, estimates from uh, some VPN companies, commercial companies, that there is a, uh, since 2019, the cost on the global economy due to internet shutdowns by government uh, exceed uh, U.S. dollars, uh, 35.5 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, and uh, I, the, another hat that I wear is actually uh, a, a trustee of the Internet Society. And I could tell you that the Internet Society Lebanon chapter also estimated that th uh, the Internet shutdown in that country in Lebanon also cost them uh, on a daily basis, U.S. dollar, $10 million. Uh, of course, the interesting reason for their shutdown is actually because of unstable power supply. So that actually echo uh, very much uh, a previous uh, uh, point about the situation in the Ukraine. Uh, now, the uh, so I think actually, uh, actually, one last point about the uh, economic impact. Uh, Internet Society actually just recently put out a study uh, that looked at the cost of internet shutdown on small businesses and especially startups. So uh, they have found that actually for come for startups in countries with shutdown comparing to the startups in countries without shutdown, actually there is a 90% loss of revenues uh, causing losses for companies. So it is a very direct uh, uh, impact that we can see on the economy of these countries. Now, finally, what can everybody do? Uh, what can civil society do? Unfortunately, we don't have the power to tell, to tell especially many of these uh, more authoritarian governments what to do and tell them not to shut down the internet. But I think forums like these are very important that we uh, look at and share these uh, potential issues that we face uh, because of internet shutdowns. Now, government obviously need to discuss about the internet shutdown at a much higher level. I'm very happy to hear that the Japanese government is going to take up this issue uh, next year when they uh, become the uh, when they take on the. I, I think, uh, Mr. Aida, you said that you're going to the Japanese government is going to take on the uh, uh, role of the chairman of the G7. Um, it, I think it's very important to put it onto the agenda on the discussion of the future of the internet. Uh, the United States government just announced yesterday that the democracy summit uh, will be held in March of next year. Maybe our next speaker will tell us more about that and, uh, and maybe 
putting uh, these issue about censorship and internet uh, shut down on the agenda of the uh, of the discussion over the declaration of the freedom of the, uh, of the future of the internet. Uh, uh, I, I think it's also very, I have to point, say that it's also very ironic that uh, the IGF this year is held in Ethiopia because of the fact that the uh, uh, Ethiopia, the Tigray region actually is well, has been facing internet shutdown. And unfortunately, you know, United Nations seems to believe that, uh, or, or at least the IGF seems, seems to believe that uh, it's still all right to hold this event in Ethiopia. Now, uh, I, I finally want to say that, uh, uh, oh, also, what about companies? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think it might be an interesting idea to explore setting up global standards uh, for behaviors of companies when they face uh, uh, these sort of uh, requests from governments to shut down. Obviously, government uh, companies are at a disadvantaged position when governments tell them to do certain things because uh, according to local laws, you know, they have to follow the laws or they will be getting into trouble or maybe their staff will get into trouble. But I think uh, it's still important to develop global standards to face these sort of censorship and shutdown requests and develop these standards, measure companies' behavior and so on. Uh, we don't want to see the situation, for example, what happened in Myanmar uh, when uh, foreign companies were forced to divest and leave the country, uh, telecommunications companies, I mean, that uh, actually will make it more difficult for the local population to access the free internet. Now, uh, a final point I want to say is that I always think that, you know, maybe we should uh, also call the internet shutdown, internet lockdowns. Because uh, uh, when I think about, for example, the zero COVID situation right now that uh, it, we're looking at in China, uh, we see many examples of uh, the lockdown situation actually costing human and social cost. For example, when there's a fire, the firemen don't go and put out the fire because there is a lockdown. When there is a, uh, a, a medical emergency, the ambulance do not get sent to those people that need help because there is a lockdown. So I think of internet shutdown in a very similar way. It is just like that, uh, the human cost, the human uh, uh, need for communications uh, is shut down. And we can think about, in addition to the political cost and human uh, and, and so on, also the loss of these kind of uh, uh, basic needs that, uh, that uh, people have uh, because they need to have the internet for these uh, basic communications requirements. So I think if I look at it this way, uh, internet shutdowns cost is very human and is very much a human rights issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Uh, you covered uh, some hints uh, to the, uh, go our government uh, for the next year's discussion and also you uh, bridged uh, to next speaker. So I invite uh, uh, Nikki, uh, Masgari, Masgati, uh, from the uh, Department of uh, State, from the U.S. government. Thank you so much, and I also want to reiterate my thanks to the Japanese government for hosting this session, this incredibly important session. And so happy to hear the news that you will be taking over the G7 presidency for the following year, and that you plan to focus on this issue. Um, I think my other fellow panelists have done a really excellent job of highlighting um, the impacts, the economic impacts, particularly uh, the costs and the foreign investment impacts, the um, impacts to human rights and freedom of expression, um, and highlighting some of the specific case studies. So what I'd like to do with the few minutes that I have is perhaps actually focus a little bit about what governments um, have done and can do and um, what we can do as a multi-stakeholder community together. So first, I'll just say that for the United States, um, the issue of Internet shutdowns has increasingly um, risen to very high levels of attention. And it is not, um, you know, uh, divorced from the fact that more and more governments are, in fact, shutting down the Internet worldwide. 
I think Access Now, Keep It On report does a very good job of documenting um, the rise in internet shutdowns, but not just um, the rise in the number of countries that are implementing them and um, the number of times they're implemented, but to um, Dr. Akbadi's um, explanation that the targeted sanctions, the smarter sanctions, and, you know, um, we might be seeing a, you know, a more limited use, but actually impacting specific communities and societies. Um, so for, I'll talk a little bit about the United States and then broaden that aperture, um, if that works for everybody. But, you know, for the United States, even under the former administration, we had already started condemning publicly the use of internet shutdowns particularly as it impacts freedom of expression online. You know, I think, you know, just to build on some of the conversation that has happened in the chat that I have the advantage of being able to see, but then also that's happened in the in the room around um, whether there's a legitimate purpose and the leg legitimate use of internet shutdowns. I think uh, Mr. Mock did a very good job of answering that, which is in fact, you know, we're getting into a very dangerous territory if we're going to be having a conversation about whether there is an ability or, excuse me, a, a reason to legitimately use um, this blunt instrument. And I think it really goes down to the arguments that governments are using to shut down their internet um, compared to the actual reason that they're shutting down the internet. So oftentimes, one of the, the biggest reasons that we here as a government from another government as to why they've chosen to shut down their internet, whether it be targeted or kind of a blanket shutdown, is often that they're citing a national security concern. But when you dig a little bit deeper, the national the national security concern is that they want to avoid cheating during their national examination, um, which you know just really mm -hmm. kind of begs the question of is that really a national security concern? But can you, as a sovereign government, tell another sovereign government that's not a national security concern, right? So I do think it's um, worthwhile for the multi-stakeholder community to spend a little bit of time actually at analyzing some of the the uh, the structural um, underlying reasons that oftentimes governments will shut down their internet and um, figure out a way to address those structural issues. You know, I think um, there was a conversation about how in China, you don't really see um, them using internet shutdowns because they already have so much control over the information space in their country. But other governments who don't quite have that sense of control either over the information space, they don't feel like they have the correct, you know, um, uh, police forces to quell any kind of like violence that might happen during um, a protest will turn to this instrument as a way to try to address all the issues, right? Because they feel like they don't have another tool. And um, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how to actually think about that structural issue, think about that underlying reason why the, um, the shutdown is in fact being implemented in that country. Um, but, you know, transitioning back to what we've done in the United States, um, we have focused quite a bit on the shaping global norms. You know, I think Charles mentioned, you know, the fact that one of the ways that we can actually address this issue from an international standpoint is to create the norm that this is not an acceptable um, action. This is not an acceptable tool to be using uh, to address, quite frankly, pretty much any issue that might be arising in the information space. Um, you know, as a a very active member of the Freedom Online Coalition, which we will take over the chairship for next year. Um, the United States, along with Access Now and Global Network Initiative, created a task force on internet shutdowns. And there's quite a bit of work that we're doing in that task force, um, developing best practices for governments to engage with other governments that are shutting down the internet, um, trying to connect that multi-stakeholder community together. The um, the community that actually observes the shutdowns to the civil society community, to the governments, to the actual telcos, and trying to create those connections and, and streams of conversations. Um, in addition, um, within the G7, uh, during the UK's presidency, we in fact pushed the issue of internet shutdowns, and we were so happy to see that reflected both in the digital minister's statement and the foreign minister's statement and a nod in the leader's statement. And excited to hear that Japan is going to pick that fo uh, pick that up and move that forward again in the next year. Um, and then finally, I, I heard a few references to the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. Of course, um, working together to address internet shutdowns is an aspect of the DFI and something that 
Um, for us, you know, it was very important to include that in the DFI to again, elevate it, to create that global norm that in fact, we really should not be shutting down the internet. Uh, I did wanna make a very quick kind of comment and almost sort of an ask, right? As a government that supports the open, interoperable, secure and reliable internet and the multi-stakeholder internet governance model, um, for us, you know, what we've seen in our engagements with governments that have shut down the internet is that oftentimes when we cite an economic cost or we cite a, the human rights impact, when we're having an engagement with a government that is shutting down the internet or is in the middle of an internet shutdown, um, it doesn't seem to matter to that government when we are citing these costs. And I think quite often it's because you know, they're using this tool because they're quite desperate, right, uh, for some sort of sense of control, whether that be in the information space, in a physical sort of space. And so I think I would implore, you know, our, our joint community to think a little bit more about what are, what are, what can we, like, what can we discuss when we're having these conversations? Because quite frankly, you know, again, the, the, the thing that they're trying to address isn't really you know, the, the reason that's being stated and there's something else underlying there and how do we create a norm so that this isn't the appropriate use of this tool. Um, and then, you know, Dr. Akbadi made a point about um, the idea about internet as a global public good. I would just say that, you know, there are quite a number of governments in the world that are discussing digital public goods and global public goods. And I think um, some of those countries are very much rights respecting and, you know, you don't really see them shutting down the internet. And then a few of them do quite often and, you know, are the number one shut it, like country that shuts down the internet around the world. And so how do we have a conversation about having um, the internet be a global public good um, in a way that's understood internationally? I think um, one of the thoughts that I've just personally been thinking about quite a bit is, um, you know, we describe the internet um, and access to the internet, freedom of expression online as a human right or fundamental freedom, um, but should we be having a conversation about it being humanitarian, right? Should we have a ha conversation about it um, and like moving past that point? Because it's quite obvious that folks should have access to um, water <laughs> and food and, and shelter, but there isn't quite that same conversation happening around the internet. Um, and it's become ubiquitous to society. It's really become part of everything in society. Um, how do we have that? How do we bring those two conversations together? Um, and so I'm gonna stop there because I'm realizing we're reaching time, but I really have appreciated this conversation from the panelists. And I'm, I look forward to this community continuing to discuss and find solutions to this really blunt instrument. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki. And, uh, uh, I'm, I have to apologize, you know, I, I, I was uh, so much uh, uh, concentrated on, on listening to the, this uh, panelist and I forgot the time but, and forgot my role of, uh, as moderator. But my uh, intention and the desire was to learn from those experts. So my desire is already fulfilled, but I want to invite the, uh, the floor to make uh, some questions and because of the time constraint, maybe I have to limit maybe two or three. So uh, I, I see three hands up and uh, uh, maybe you, <laughs> okay, just try. So uh, let me uh, invite uh, these three uh, people to make a, a question. Uh, first, I would like uh, to thank for, um, Japan government for facilitating this kind of uh, uh, open um, forum. So my question is uh, f for the association of the operators. So uh, it, is, it, is, it is obvious that uh, currently ha half of the world population is governed by some kind of authoritarian government so uh, if we <laughs> if if we do not think uh, some way of delivering this uh, necessarily public goods um, for those in needs it is not always an option uh, only to advocate not to shut downs so those authoritarian government cannot be 
go away. Even for the next 50 years or 100 years, they will be continue, some kind of government. So uh, my question is, is there any technological advance, advancement, like when a crisis affected community, especially because of war or civil, like Myanmar and other uh, uh, places that are affected by some kinds of uh, authoritarian um, crisis? Uh, to deliver this public good using like satellite technologies. So uh, some kinds of uh, humanitarian uh, civil societies uh, or like even United Nations can deliver this like a food. Food and water will be delivered for those communities. So this uh, access must be also be delivered, but the, d the way of deliver delivering it must be um, innovative and must be come to this this world so thank you very much so that's my question okay thank you very much so uh, allow me to collect a uh, question first okay thank you so much um my name is sandra Acheng, and i'm from uganda i am with women of uganda network so my question first of all goes to nikki who talked about um creating a task force uh, on internet shutdowns during the freedom online coalition and um, uh, the panel really emphasizing about the internet being a global or a global public good. How is the, um, the task force that has been created um, going to ensure that the perspective of uh, women or marginalized and structurally silenced group are going to be included in the discussion of the impact of internet shutdowns? And then um, I wanted to also talk about um, uh, some submission on the impact of internet shutdowns. I think it's very important to start looking at um, the impact of inter internet shutdowns on um, the different sustainable development goals, the 17th SAM or all, um, which is very important. Also, also um, looking at um, the emphasis on the impact of internet shutdowns on the economic um, um, economic aspect of the country, I think it's also very important to look at um, what is the impact of internet shutdowns on some of the marginalized or structurally silenced groups. And also, I wanted to also allude to the point about um, starting to quantify the impact of internet shutdowns. I think um, one of the aspects is that we need to start um, thinking about the network measurements. Um, Trying, doing training on, on network measurements on um, the impact of internet shutdowns such as ONI, uh, IOTA, and of course looking at the, the global, I mean the Google transparency reports that exist uh, when we talk about quantifying. I think this is very important when we are positioning ourselves in advocacy around um, the impact of internet shutdowns, looking at both um, what is the quality, the quantifying and the quantifying and qualifying uh, of the impact of internet shutdowns uh, on, the, on, on human rights in different countries. And of course, um, I think also it's very important that um, one of the speakers uh, talked about, um, uh, I think, com creating community networks. Um, so I think it's also very important to start thinking about what are some of the coping strategies um, when internet shutdowns happen, because that has really been um, a very big aspect because um, when we're talking about internet shutdown, sometimes um, there is the, the internet outrage and internet blockage. So when it's the, uh, there is an internet outrage, that means that someone is not able to access um, internet shutdowns totally. For example, for the case of Uganda, we still have Facebook blocked until now uh, since the January 2021 elections and nothing has been done around about that and you can imagine how much of the impact of internet shutdowns has been created on, on several sectors in the country and of course um, some of the structurally silenced group or women have been able to uh, leave the platform and they do not know that you're supposed maybe to use a VPN to be able to access or use Facebook. So this, those are some of the conversations we need to start having around um, the impact of internet shutdowns and of course positioning ourselves on advocacy on internet shutdowns. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, third gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Mohammed Yassin uh, from the University of Lille. Uh, but I will speak on my capacity as a Sudanese citizen. 
who was a former under secretary of federal governance in the transitional government of Sudan. Uh, and when the military coup occurred in Sudan, there was a in shutdown uh, imposed on the population. And still it continued to be. Uh, there is, uh, even today, today while we are here, there is slowdown because they are people who are going to the streets uh, calling for uh, civil, uh, civil government while the military are imposing on the private company or the telecommunication company to slow down and shut down. Uh, is there any innovative way? It goes also with my fellow um, Ethiopian uh, brother. Is there any way that to uh, put to sanction the companies themselves who buy, who submit themselves to the, to the call of the government? Maybe like migrating uh, the subscription from them. If you allow shutdown, we will op we will create another alternative company. So all the subscribers to that company will migrate from you, and we are going to to provide them the service. So they will they will lend, and then they will lose they will lose their money in this case, and they were not going to submit this this solution could be sort about like uh, sort of about like an alternative in order not to punish only only the governments but also to punish the the the, the private sector who is the, the operational arm of of this uh, uh, shutdown or slow this is just uh, i don't know if it is visible or not uh, like also uh, Instead of uh, using the, na the the national key for the country, which is plus something, then you use something which is global, which is satellite dependent and doesn't uh, depend on the country's uh, dictatorial system. And uh, hello, my name is Julia. Um, I'm from uh, Russia and Peer Dialogue. I've got two short questions. Uh, really, uh, you said that you face uh, shutdown because of energy crisis. We also face shutdown, a political one, uh, when Russia finds itself in IT isolation. We don't have plenty of services in Russia, as you know. Uh, we also live without uh, corporate software products uh, that are necessary for businesses, and uh, even with blocked Visa and MasterCard, so we can pay by card, uh, for example, here. Uh, it's millions of uh, blocked uh, uh, bank transactions, uh, so we are shut down from a global bank system while almost 70% uh, of Russians are used to um, uh, pay online. Uh, so uh, could we do with that? That's my first question. And the second, uh, the next speaker um, said uh, from uh, US uh, that internet should be accessible as water. I strongly agree with that, strongly appreciate that. Uh, but what if water is uh, poisoned, uh, as you know, in February 22, uh, after the special military operation started, Meta allowed uh, online users to call for violence against Russians. Uh, also, what could we do with that? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, because the time is already... Uh, so, just very quickly. A, a form of internet shutdown um, in parts of the country. And outside of this place, and on Twitter and so on and so forth, one doesn't see the term irony, one sees the term hypocrisy. And the UN is accused of hypocrisy. And there, there are people legitimately you know, commenting on, is it, is it right to, to be meeting here at all? And I, I'm inclined to the view that as long as um, we are safe to be able to, in this place, uh, both praise the Ethiopian government for the things that it's doing right, and criticize governments for the things that are wrong, um, then we're not guilty of hypocrisy. Then, then we're trying to build a, a, a society in which things are open. But I, I, I think it, it, it would be very, very remiss of, of the IGF as, as, a, as a body and for people who participate in the IGF, and I think an accusation of hypocrisy might fly, if we don't find ways to hold two seemingly contradictory notions in mind. On the one hand, we can sympathize and understand um, that people have defensive 
responses to things, that a government has a responsibility to protect its sov sovereignty. There's a, an old Latin expression, salus republica uh, suprema lex, you know, the, the, the existence of the state is the supreme law. Uh, and that leads governments to doing things. Um, we understand that governments have police officers with guns, but we have to also understand that when governments do things that infringe on global norms that infringe on human rights, that government should be criticized. So, you know, the United States of America undertakes actions quite often, and there are protests about it. There, there's action about it. Is it safe, and I'm sure as hell hoping it is safe, for us to criticize the Ethiopian government's conduct in enforcing an internet shutdown? Is it safe to say that Russia's conduct in 2012 already, well before the current situation, of implementing blacklists and internet restrictions inside that country flies against the global norms of an open internet. Because if we can't say that as an IGF, if we cannot, in our participation, you know, create the space where we can say, yes, we understand why governments do this or do that, or we understand that a lot of political things have nuance and complications and so on and so forth. But Governments can, and I mean, there, there's, we, we can legitimately, we must be able to legitimately criticize the European Union, the European Commission on certain decisions that they've made in response to certain things and so on and so forth. Because if we can't have that criticism, we can't have an informed and engaged debate after the fact. You know, we need to be able to say we understand why you did that at the time or based on the information that you, you, you took that decision. But I am quite concerned and, and what I'd like you know, to ask the panelists, uh, maybe just the ones who aren't in the room, but <laughs> possibly the ones in the room, is are we in a position where we're prepared to say that it is right and proper for an organization like the IGF and for events like the IGF to say, yes, we understand why governments do things and why governments, every government commits crimes at certain points in time, every government violates human rights at some point in time, but that when governments do that, it is the duty of the internet community and people in the internet community to criticize them. And, and, and so my question is, yeah, does anybody else share that, that sense from the panel? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So first, uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Marit and then uh, Nikki to respond to some of the questions and uh, I will uh, ask all the panelists to respond more. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, in the discussion we already, from the operator's point of view, operators being kind of the, the, the if you like, the instrument um, uh, in an unintended way, uh, even even to do the shutdowns or partial or, or full shutdowns, um, and how to avoid it or how to how to how to get around it, it's a tricky question, and I'm now having to resort back to the European context because in Europe at least operators are very regulated uh, sector, so you need to have a license to be an operator, you need to have a license to have spectrum to actually provide con uh, connectivity services. And the licenses don't come from the skies, they come from the government. So if the government then basically uh, tells you that now you've got to shut down this and that because I just introduced a new law and it says that you know this is what we're gonna do, the operator, if they want to be a compliant company and out of trouble, they most likely will be doing what the government law says and et cetera because they have the license and they have been given this right. Now, are there any ways around it in a crisis scenario? Well, uh, I don't know, somebody mentioned community networks before, I think as something uh, that might work, depends, I guess, circ on circumstances. Satellites might be something, I think we've seen that uh, working out in crisis situations uh, before. So there might be ways, but, but certainly I don't think that when an operator under a certain jurisdiction, they've in good faith entered the market, maybe with the risk assessment saying like, well, this is a risky market, but as you said, we need, we need internet services to be serving all people and, and many people, so we want to launch services here. Um, but, but then if, if, if there is a government order, you cannot really blame the operator for doing that because they are just doing what is the law in that country. Um, and I guess the other option then is not to accept that law and shut down your business and leave that country, which you know doesn't really help the the, the position of the regular citizen either. So sorry for not bringing you maybe the answers you wanted to hear, but uh, that's the way I see it. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, is there uh, Nikki still on? 
line? Yes, I'm uh, on, and, and I will um, have to jump off right after this. But I, I, I did want to come to the question around um, representation of, uh, I guess I should say, an inclusive representation on the uh, Freedom Online Coalition's task force on internet shutdown. So that's something that's uh, very much a priority, I would say, for the whole Freedom Online Coalition. Um, in addition to this task force on shutdowns, there's also a task force on digital equality. And um, one of the mandates is that, in fact, all of the different task forces have an eye for making sure that the work that is done um, is equitable. Um, it, it emphasizes um, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, and so this is very much on our radar and something that the task force is thinking about and any type of engagement and it's focused on also the impact to the marginalized communities. Um, thankfully, we actually also have expanded the aperture. So the task force includes members outside of the actual Freedom Online Coalition um, in terms of we've invited the measurement communities. So like Uni and Ayura um, and some of the other members have have joined and are actually helping to make those connections in the task force. Um, and I think the sort of last point I want to just say is that, um, you know, I think the conversation around um, the hosting of IGF in Ethiopia is, is, a, is a rich one. And I appreciate the comments. Um, we understand that under the terms of the secession of hostilities, um, they committed to the, the government of Ethiopia is committed to expedite and coordinate restoration of essential services in the Tigray region. Um, we understand that restoration is underway for some basic services, and we call on the Ethiopian government to expedite the resumption of internet access in conflicted areas. So I just wanted to be very clear about the position that we've taken on this. And I believe that many other governments that are participating in IGF have a, a similar position. But um, with that, I will leave you all. Thank you so much for having me as a panelist. Uh, I leave you in the good hands of my other panelists. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I, I ask other three panelists if you uh, have anything to, to, to respond or to say at. Should I? Sure, just uh, briefly, uh, I guess, um, I threw out the question on on whether there are any legitimate uh, uh, reasons to to do shutdown, and I'm actually quite pleased uh, to hear my fellow panelists um, uh, remind us all that probably not, <laughs> and that's probably the right answer. Um, but I want to add a couple things. Uh, so besides the community network, um, I think it's an important uh, uh, you know uh, response in terms of resilience. I think also you know issues like shutdown of certain services like uh, Twitter or or Facebook actually really should be mitigated uh, better by, by civil society embracing more of a kind of federated uh, uh, social media. Let's get out of these big you know, platforms and go to a federated uh, uh, social media uh, um, uh, approach, then you know, it's much harder <laughs> to, to shut down a, you know, uh, a, a federated uh, social media network rather than you know, a, a centralized platform. So you know, I, I'll, I'll throw that out for, for, for your thoughts as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What about uh, 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 Charles or Professor Akbari? Uh, yes, I'll just have a quick uh, a comment and then I also have to leave. But uh, I think a couple points about the question about this use of satellite and low orbit, uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellite. Uh, the unfortunate fact is that I think the technology is not quite ready for all kinds of different use, uh, because typically if you are in a situation where a country is trying to enforce uh, censorship in that country, they would probably not release or allow these uh, downlink equipments to be imported to those countries. So I would have to say that, for example, the situation in Ukraine is very, very different from the situation in Iran, because uh, the Ukrainian government of obviously would welcome such equipment to be imported, but not the Iranian government. So I think it is not a magic bullet. Uh, the technology must be made more easily accessible to people without uh, having, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the kind of uh, dangling equipment that is currently required. And one final point about the uh, question about <laughs> from the uh, Russian uh, 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 audience, uh, I think sanctions on an 
about an illegal war is very different from an intergovernmental uh, decision, including uh, many discussion and votes in the United Nations about uh, a, a about a certain event about a war, and it, 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 we have to say that it's very different from what the decision of a government itself to shut itself. Uh, to shut down its own internet. Uh, these are two different things, so I don't think we can mix them up. And uh, the uh, uh, and we have to refer to also the fact that even when the Ukrainian government requests for a shutdown of the .au domain, for example, uh, of Russia, that was not taken up by the global internet community or uh, most of the governments around the world or, or the other major governments around the world that are opposed to the illegal war. So I think that is a testament to the fact that, you know, just don't mix up these two different things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Professor Akbari there? Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to also make a very short comment because I also have to leave, unfortunately. Um, I think um, um, uh, somebody from JICA also mentioned in the comments, and I really agree with that, uh, to understand that internet shutdowns, when we are talking about internet shutdowns, we are not talking about internet shutdowns that are happening for technical reasons or so on. We are talking, at least I was talking about internet shutdowns as a way of uh, censorship, control and surveillance. Um, and in that context, I think it is important to understand that this is this is a method being used, in, especially in countries, in authoritarian countries, that they have a very bad record of human rights violations. So that's a very different discussion when we talk about Internet shutdowns in that context um, com compared to, for example, Internet shutdowns that happen because of cybersecurity. And unfortunately, in those contexts, what we see is, as I was trying to say, digital sovereignty is um, a, a lot of um, you have a lot of excuses, I would say, um, um, protecting the family values, uh, protecting the cybersecurity and so on. These excuses are being used um, sort of structurally in a way to care access to the global Internet and control the free flow of information. So the political context of the Internet shutdown plays a very important role, how we understand and how fo we formulate any kind of uh, encounter, any kind of policy regulation, any kind of norm development when we talk about internet shutdowns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, time is uh, uh, pretty much over and I have to apologize uh, uh, if any inconvenience uh, uh, to uh, audience. And so at the end, thank you very much for the discussion and also thank you very much for the questions. and. Uh, I think uh, we had a very productive discussion and uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, whatever evaluation or argument we have, uh, we are very grateful for the uh, Ethiopian government and the people's initiative to host uh, IGF this year. So thank you very much for the discussion and the uh, session is over.